There has been cynical and racist way to attack the Chinese people. But we have seen them uh, now, even the Chinese vaccine has not killed anyone. You've seen how the socialist countries have managed the pandemic. It is amazing. Look at Cuba. Cuba had to go and help the most developed countries in Europe to try and avoid, uh, you know, several deaths. Look at China, that even though there has been cynical and racist way to attack. And a very good afternoon to you, our viewers, and thank you so much for joining us on yet another episode of our CPK Online Bulletin. And on today's episode, we'll be focusing on a few issues that are current in the country and also debunking a few myths on communism. And our guest today is a member from the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Kenya. And I will let him introduce himself without any much further ado. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, comrade Sefu and um, to our viewers my name is Buka Ngesa Omole I am the acting vice chairperson of the Communist Party of Kenya and um, I am also the national organizing secretary and a member of the central committee of the Communist Party of Kenya thank you so much Buka for joining us on this interview uh, today and my first question would be what what does your roles in the central committee um, require for example as the acting vice chairperson and also as the organizing secretary what do you get up to on your daily activities what I will say is that the work of the central committee is to implement the resolutions of the uh, national, uh, you know, Congress, which is the highest uh, decision-making organ of the party, and all the duties, um, you know, are given to me not just from the party constitution, but also from time to time by our meetings of the central committee. But I, my daily work in the Communist Party of Kenya is to organize the party register and also to coordinate the study circles and deliberately organize for uh, you know events not just in terms of recruitment but also to highlight certain events on behalf of the Kenyan masses and the working class. And in your role in highlighting or organizing for the events, would you like to tell us a few or maybe uh, highlight a few events that you have organized in the past year uh, in relation to that, that you know, relates to the Kenyan masses at large? Yes, we've carried out uh, the mandate of the party through various uh, working committees, which is a collective effort uh, within the party. And we have engaged the masses in terms of defending their daily struggles. And um, many a times it is about the hard life that come with um, the realities of a neocolonial system. Uh, for example, we have heard about the, you know, the most infamous um, constitutional amendment bill that was known as the BBI initiative that was crafted by President Uru Kenyatta and his um, friend or so-called brother Aila Molo Dinga. So the CPK has been in the forefront to organize uh, popular demonstrations and uh, political literacy program to highlight that indeed the Kenyan people, you know, placed their expectations in a legal document. And that legal document cannot be amended from a process of illegality. We've had also a few challenges, you know, from last year to this year. We've had um, 
the effects of the pandemic, which is COVID-19. But you also realize that COVID-19 only affects the lower stratus of the society, mainly the frontline workers, uh, the members of the hotel and entertainment industries. And we have organized pickets in Nairobi to highlight the unscientific way that the President Uru Kenyatta has used to handle the COVID. It, it, actually, it's not even unscientific. It's basically copy and paste from other foreign governments that has put, uh, you know, many workers and the poor people deep into, uh, you know, economic crisis and only put money in the hands of uh, businessmen and uh, a few politicians. Well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, when you talk about the issue of COVID-19 and the economic crisis that, you know, has been seen the world over, but also when you talk about workers and especially when you're mentioning people in the uh, hospitality and entertainment industry, yeah. you also talked about um, having to organize these people to pick it against the unscientific ways in which, you know, the government took to look to alleviate these measures. What measures do you think, first of all, the government should have taken to alleviate, you know, the plight of the workers who lost their jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic? Just like any other pandemic, any reasonable government will first set a policy of non-profiteering. Okay. And also to cushion the lower stratus of that society from the uh, you know, from the imminent death of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So what we see as a pandemic in the globe or in Kenya in this con context also presented um, enormous opportunities for either the government to redeem itself by implementing um, social programs that could cushion the Kenyan workers, but also uh, an opportunity to express their greed in the sense that they're using the pandemic to profiteer and um, uh, only put money in the pockets of a few rich people. Mm -hmm. But we gave out a five demand approach uh, uh, to the Kenya government. And the Communist Party of Kenya has always held that in the event that there is a pandemic of that magnitude of COVID-19, then definitely we encourage the scientific methodology in terms of handling the, uh, the pandemic. And one of the scientific uh, methodologies was to carry out a robust research that is based on um, informed um, uh, scientific methods. For example, we had recommended for the government that instead of just issuing a blanket um, you know, uh, that nobody should go to work and people Rules should stay home. Yes. At least you, you could be happy that if you are at home, then a health a healthcare practitioner will come to at least uh, make sure that, uh, you know, you are tested for COVID-19. And then after that, there will be a robust effort of national immunization. But we had people just staying at home, doing nothing, you know, um, and uh, they are suffering from anxiety. There is no money for medicine. There's no money for her to take care of their families. So they are expected to stay home and die in actual sense. So uh, that to us was unacceptable because people will not stay home, you know, to die because the rich want to avoid death, you know, from COVID. And, uh Thank you very much uh, when you talk about that and when you're talking about uh, people staying home and the measures that the government uh, should have provided including the health and immunization measures. As a third world country and where we are right now when we look at our country, when we look at our governance, there are very many things that we have not been able to achieve. When you talk about social amenities like schools and hospitals, um, we have seen the deteriorating state of such amenities uh, in our country and I think this is something that is um, attributed to the governance and to the leadership of the day. What would be the position of the Communist Party of Kenya when it comes to governance and leadership and also in the upcoming 2022 elections? If now you're talking about an alternative of what the government should or would have done better, what would be the stand of the Communist Party of Kenya? In terms of looking at uh, the way the economy is modeled, and if you look at it, 
then you realize that all the government plans are not pro-people. There are a few that are only, you know, they're only doing a lip service, but in many ways, most of the government rollout plans are meant to only favor a few businessmen. Mm -hmm. And like I would say, the nature of the Kenyan state as we know it is a very neo-colonial system. And that means they do not have any initiative that is inward looking. And in that case, then people are bound to have problems because most of the policies that are implemented by the Kenyan government are foreign influenced. In fact, uh, we have seen uh, currently, like today's news, the main austerity measures that have been placed on the, on the fuel levy, and we have seen uh, the price of uh, basic commodities going up. We have seen a demand from IMF and World Bank in terms of, uh, 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 you know, to make sure that the government uh, cuts off expenditure on social services. We have even seen a list of retrenchment and uh, privatization that are going on. So for us in the Communist Party of Kenya, we will want an inward looking process that take cognizance of, uh, of course, the international and the global uh, economic um, environment that we exist. But as long as the government still continue to pursue uh, the co colonial modernities of doing business, then we will only see a few rich people that are prospering to make money. But in actual sense, the majority of the Kenyan people will continue to languish in poverty. Do you think the crisis that we have right now is an issue of governance? And if yes, how is it an issue of governance? And if that is the case, then how, what would the Communist Party do differently if that is the problem that we've had over time? The economic crisis in our country is basically based on austerity measures that is being forced upon us by multinationals that the government of Kenya has majorly accessed loans that are not viable from uh, international um, uh, you know, money organizations like IMF and World Bank. And they are put in, if you look at the Kenyan treasury, they are put in preconditions for government to secure more loans and to service the existing loans. And the easiest way to cushion them from defaulting is over taxation of the poor people on the basic commodities like, you know, unga, the basic commodities like fuel. So in that way, we see that our country is actually being auctioned. What will the Communist Party do when we're in government? Of course, the first thing is to protect our economy from, um, uh, like um, Malimu Julius Nyerere used to tell us, that you cannot put a featherweight and you cannot put a uh, featherweight and a heavyweight in the same ring. So the competition that we are seeing only favors multinationals in our country. So the first thing is to cut off, you know, uh, all the outward looking planning of our economy and bring back an internal looking of the economy and restore the path for industrialization. In that way, then we could be able to sort out many problems because you could see the main problem in this country that we have even talked about at the Communist Party of Kenya is unemployment of the youth. How do you want to employ the youth when in actual sense you are shutting industries? How do you want to employ the youth when you are not investing in state-owned enterprises? How do you want to, you know, employ the youth when you have surrendered your national economy to the private sector? So in that way then you could see that the Communist Party of Kenya is actually for a state-owned and run economy and not a purely uh, capitalist model where the private sector are the people who are driving the economy. In the initial stages, we can look for a three-tier economy run by the private sector, the cooperatives, and the, 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 the government. But the government must be a key player in the economy. So in that way, then we are able to just not be spectators when people are profiteering from um, the poor people, but we are key stakeholders in terms of um, not, not just uh, a government where we sit somewhere to introduce physical policies, 
but we materially are a big part of the employer in the sector. Thank you very much for that question. Previously, we had uh, some youth and members of the party from the Gidurai study circle, and the issue of youth unemployment uh, came out quite a bit, and I think we can tackle that uh, much later uh, in this interview. So we, we're talking about uh, the daily struggle of the people and the economic crisis you know, that we are in as a nation and, and worldwide. And when you talk about the Communist Party of Kenya, uh, you uh, say that the Communist Party of Kenya fights for the proletariat and the exploited and the workers. And when we see, for example, the existential crisis that we are in uh, in the moment when we're talking about, for example, the high prices of fuel, which uh, is a domino effect on other commodities such as, of course, uh, basic uh, food commodities like uh, water and milk, etc. Uh, do you think that the levies that are sanctioned or the high taxation that um, we have to pay for as a country to um, that we have to pay for as a country, for example, to feed into the multinationals or to please the multinationals is part of the reason why we have such you know high prices of fuel and commodities uh, in the country? And how does that affect the common monanchi? Uh, taxation is another issue, but use of the proceeds from tax, that is what we need to really look at, because even the Communist Party of Government will tax the Kenyan people. But the question is, when we are doing over taxation, basically to, you know, to take money from the poor to the rich and to plug a debt hole, you know, that we have actually created by ourselves and also to meet certain conditionalities to put the country, you know, even in deeper debt. Then we see that the overtaxations of the poor people uh, at the expense, oh, when we know that the rich are already trying to get money from the government in terms of, um, you know, uh, credits uh, for the um, uh, PAYA as pay as you earn in, uh, income tax and in that way then we see an equal way in which the the state operates in terms of um, either uh, putting a pro people policy or to try and advance a purely a capitalist approach where the rich get the money and the poor pay for them uh, I think well, during the beginning of this pandemic we even seen the multi-billionaires that came from we popularly known as the COVID uh, billionaires. And these were not um, people that are normal people. These were relatives of the president, the relatives of people in power that actually took advantage of certain loopholes within the Kenyan economy to enrich themselves. So in overall sense, what we are trying to put through to this government that the Jubilee administration has since failed uh, and they have failed to cushion the poor people and the workers due to wrong policy initiatives and also failing to take part uh, and to play a major part in terms of um, you know controlling and also being a participant in the Kenyan economy. When you look at the situation in the country right now or the class that the classes that we have in the country we can clearly say that we have um, people who are you know, running in opulence and, and riches, and we have a class of people who are suffering in abject poverty. And one of the issues that was supposed to alleviate this for the Kenyans was you know, the issue of multipartism or democracy, or even the elections that we are going to have in 2022, which are seen as a means of liberation for the people. But this is something that we have not seen uh, in previous years because the elections are marred with violence and with, with tribalism and with media uh, propaganda, um, do you think that um, these are elections that we're going to participate in is a way of liberating our people? And if yes, then how do we get out of you know, the issue of tribalism and rallying around, you know, this is my person and this is our person, which of course is one of the things that is plaguing the Kenyan people. And if no, then what is the alternative? for liberation of the people? The current status quo, which is um, a neo-colonial capitalist uh, government, thrives on divisions. 
There are divisions that are apparent and there are divisions that are real. Those divisions that they thrive on, for example, on ethnic mobilization, you realize that um, each nation or each tribe has now produced their tribal leaders and they're trying to negotiate for power. So the ethnic division that is being uh, promoted in Kenyan politics has nothing to do with the Kenyan people, but has all to do with the current political elite in Kenya getting into power. In fact, in the event that there was never any a negative ethnicity in Kenya, then they will choose another point of division. Mm -hmm. For example, religion, mm -hmm. we have seen in many ways. They will choose clanism. So capitalism, and this is something that is very historic in our country, when the colonial um, imperial Britain came to our country, the first thing was to make sure that Kenya was divided in tribal, ethnic, um, you know, nations yeah. and to try to divide and rule them. Mm -hmm. In that way, that is the democracy that we've inherited from our colonial masters. And you think that is the democracy that is being practiced right now? So the second part of the democracy, other than divisions that is created by the current status quo, is to try and remove the Kenyan people from reality. And to remove the Kenyan people from reality is to turn a well-intentioned democracy that is in the Constitution in a capitalist democracy. And in a capitalist democracy, what it essentially means is that money is the alpha and omega, in the sense that the people with money can be elected in position. But majorly the poor and the working class are only turned to be, you know, voting machines every five years. And you cannot call that a democracy. That is a dictatorship of capitalism. It's a dictatorship of the rich. In, in replacing that, what does Communist Party of Kenya want to then put through? What we are saying that all other political parties of Kenya, even the, the ones of Jubilee and ODM that calls themselves social democratic parties that are pro-reforms, they are only capitalist or imperialist stooges in our country. And the, on the other side, we have the Communist Party of Kenya that is organizing for a pro-people democracy of a socialist democracy. But that socialist democracy can only be realized when we are highly organized and have declared ourselves as a national movement. So the question then comes, why would Communist Party of Kenya be participating in the national bourgeois elections in 2022. And we have a very clear mandate, is that even though we are going to participate in the bourgeoisie elections, in, 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 the, in the national elections 2022, we are very much aware of the limitation of the bourgeois democracy, because it is a democracy that is made of money. So the first mandate of the Communist Party of Kenya when we approach the elections is to take advantage of that situation that the political environment has created to educate our people, to do our propaganda work, to highlight the failures of the current democracy. So each and every candidate of the Communist Party of Kenya will be able to highlight clearly uh, the contradictions that are inherent in the capitalist democracy and also push our ideas in the mass space. Because as so long as the masses still believe in the elections, the Communist Party of Kenya has to be there with the masses. So the, the, the second most important reason why we are going to participate in, um, in next year's elections is to try the class consciousness in Kenya. For example, if say if you go to Samir and you want to uh, contest for a political seat and you realize that at the end of the voting, when the votes are counted, you only get one vote, then that is a clear measure that the only conscious person is one vote. So you know the amount of work that you know, you've got to do to make sure that you, you increase the level of uh, the, the class consciousness. The consciousness. And of course, we, we talk about, you know, one of the roles of the Communist Party is to awaken the conscience of the masses. Buka, my question, 
exactly on, on the issue of elections is, do you think that this is a way in which the people can get liberation from the issues that are plaguing them at the moment? And if yes, then how, how come this is something that we have not achieved through the years? And if no, what is the alternative? Just very... Uh, Communist concise. Party of Kenya is a revolutionary party. We don't see liberation coming through the capitalist uh, elections. Mm -hmm. So we are saying, just from our teacher Lenin, that we are going to engage in bourgeois elections yes. to move our agenda, mm -hmm. to test the class consciousness of our people, yeah. and to prepare people for an all out, even though, what do we stand to lose in engaging in elections? We, actually nothing. In the actual sense, even if we find our members in the parliament, what will they do other than to highlight the contradictions that are inherent in a colonial system? So we are not going to be deluded by the national election because for the Communist Party of Kenya, organizing and mobilizing the masses is a permanent exercise they must do. And the election is only an event to do those three things that I have highlighted. So the Kenyan people, if they think that liberation will come in the 2022 elections without thinking out of the box, then we can tell them we are sorry. You can only extend your pain. Mm -hmm. Nothing will change if you have the same players that continue to use you know, media, they continue to use um, you know, money and um, uh, tribal divisions to further their own selfish agenda. Thank you for going deeper into that. And you know, you just mentioned Samia, which is my home area, and I was taken a bit uh, aback by that. Probably I'll try and you know vie for political seat to to see the consciousness of of where I come from. And uh, with that, then I would ask you, what is the what would be the difference of the Communist Party of Kenya from all the other? Uh, parties that we have in the state and of course who um, propagate themselves or put themselves out there to be fighting for you know the oppressed and the people of the lower strata and you know to want to liberate our people and to give them you know a better better living standards. The Communist Party of Kenya is the only political party that has a clear political program to organize and mobilize the Kenyan people. Mm -hmm. That means we we have a contract that we want to sign with the Kenyan people. We want to tell the Kenyan people that if you elect the Communist Party of Kenya, then Kenya will delink itself from the neocolonial system that has dominated it, and we will take a path towards industrialization. So we have a clear political uh, program that we want to see in the midterm and on the long term. The other political parties, which I don't like to call political parties because they are only, you know, pockets of um, a few initiatives of individuals that uh, now you can see what they are doing online. They are trying to uh, rush towards recruitment and they are saying you can register to our party for free and the people who belong to those parties do not even understand the political ideology that is behind it. But if you come to our Communist Party of Kenya, we are clear on the people we are mobilizing. We are a party of the working class. Yes. We are a party of the poor. We are a party of the peasants. And we are challenging the dictatorship of the rich. And this is clear in our mind every time that we are organizing. And in, when we talk about organizing, and especially when you talk about you know, organizing the poor and the peasants and the workers, and also in your role when you're in charge of recruiting members into the party, are there any challenges that you face uh, when it comes to this? Maybe you just want to highlight a few of them. The capitalist anti-poor propaganda is really hard. Mm -hmm. Every day when I go to organize, especially in the informal settlements or even the rural areas, those people embrace our ideas. They like the program of the Communist Party of Kenya, but they have been dented with, um, you know, uh, every time you go to the mass media space, they are told that they are poor because uh, they do not work hard. Mm -hmm. They are told that they are poor because, for a fact, they are lazy. But that is not true in our country. So, in many ways, 
the workers and the peasants in this country has find a lot of hope in the Communist Party of Kenya. Who has, uh, the Communist Party of Kenya has managed to make the people of the lower stratas in this country see the truth. That even if we talk about the rich people in this country, it's not that they worked so hard. We cannot see any person who work hard than the Kenyan workers or the poor people in this country. But the people who are swimming in opulence is either their fathers and grandfathers robbed this country or, you know, they are robbing themselves. Oh. So in many ways, the challenges that we could say we are facing, like many other communist parties in the world, is that the world is dominated by the backward ideas of capitalism. Okay. So everybody, uh, there are all these um, non-governmental organizations that are imperial stooges, and what they want to do is to tell the Kenyan people that they could be rich by working hard in a capitalist system, or that they could achieve more by starting some small business like selling tomatoes or even you know s selling some tumba clothing so th they are trying to tell the people that if, if the government is not providing this please take your future in your own hands and then try and sell something but in in, in our clarity of thought is that the only hope of the poor people in this country is to hold their government accountable and ask for social services that they are paying for. And any attempt, for example, I pity some of the political leaders who go to, you know, they want to contribute money and ask the poor people also to contribute money to render services that has actually been abdicated by the county and the national government. In fact, that is double taxation. What we should continue to insist on is that we should hold the government of the day responsible and mobilize the people for the final day, which the final day is to give a final dent to the current elite and start the process of building our country towards, you know, the national development. Okay, and you've spoken about maybe the people of the lower strata and the peasants and uh, the working class who really take to the idea of communism and feel that, you know, it is a hope for them once they get to know about it. What did you say about the other classes in society, like the middle class or the other people in society and their take uh, to communism and why is it, do you think um, it's like that? In fact, the people who hate Communist Party of Kenya are mainly the rich people in our country. But we are not worried about them mm -hmm. because the hate is, you know, mutual. The same way they hate us is the same way we hate them because we are planning to overthrow them. So we don't see any problem with the people that we are challenging their positions of the privilege to hate us. The middle class, which we relate with, in fact, the petty bourgeoisie strators in this country that we relate with, they will either way support us if our victory is guaranteed. Otherwise, they will continue to stay with that nostalgia that one time they will be rich. For example, if somebody is running a shop somewhere, he only needs a supermarket to come and he will close the shop to go and look for work in the supermarket. If you are making some clothes or you are making some shoes, you only need the big butter factory to open and you close. So what we are trying to tell the middle class that what you are living through now by auctioning the poor is a lie. But the Communist Party of Kenya that is organizing an alternative offensive we are actually organizing and conspiring to take the, party, the, the, the political power from the rich and bring it down to the Kenyan masses. Right. So they have all the, the privileges or all the to, to try and badmouth us or do anything okay. because uh, they see us as an imminent threat to, to, their, to, their, to their privileged position in this society. Okay. And, if we are to organize them, in fact, when we are debating with them, we know clearly what they are doing. For example, if you go to them, they, they, are, they want to capture the, the religious community, they want to capture the mass media, they want even to capture our education system, so that they make sure that the ideas within that system are the ideas of the old society. Okay. What then that brings to us is not even a challenge, but it brings to us an opportunity to organize and continue because the greed of the rich are very few. In our country, there are just about 
a few of them, 1% of the Kenyan population. So the 1% hate can only be neutralized by the 99% love of the rest of the Kenyan people. How does one join the Communist Party of Kenya? How does one become a member? The Communist Party of Kenya is a vanguard party and it is also a mass party. Please explain the terms vanguard and mass for the people who may not be members of the Communist Party, then we can proceed. The vanguard party are the people who understand the clarity of ideology, the science of the liberation mm -hmm. of the proletariat. Yes. And that is Marxist-Leninist, so they have to be members of study circles. They have to recommit themselves every day to learn the Communist Party of Kenya ideology, not just academically, but also to take up the, from theory and move to practice. In that way, then it will take you about eight months to be a candidate, to be a cadre member in the Communist Party of Kenya. For mass. you to take any leadership position in this party, you have to be a cadre. Mm -hmm. You have to have gone through the, pro the process. You, have a, you must have shown greater service in the communist local movement and international movement. The mass members is that we have to we use that two-way organization in terms of reaching out the masses. So we have cadres and also we have mass line. So the masses are the people who support us based on our involvement on the daily struggles. For example, if you go to the landless movement, they know that the Communist, the communist, the communist Party of Kenya is always on their side to defend that space and make sure that they have right to land. If you go to the people, for example, in Yandaro that are fighting, you know, brokers of milk and um, farm produce, then they know that the Communist Party of Kenya, you know, is willing to stand with them shoulder to shoulder in defending that space. So we have mass support in terms of areas that we have won real tangible solutions for the poor or for the workers. But for the, the leaders that we have, for our party cadres that are carefully recruited from the ranks of the working class and the poor people, and we take them through riga of training them to be communist and to be able to defend this movement, then at least you have to be with us in the study circles for about eight months to be able to be a candidate, to be a member of the cadres. Thank you so much. And how does one contest for political office, for example, in the Communist Party? Yeah, we, we will want to uh, recognize the progress that we have made the Constitutional 2010. Yes. And there is a clear, a very clear uh, moral standing in the Constitution on who can buy. Those people that we have met when we are doing our mass work, whether they are poor people, or they are working class people, or they are jobless people. As so long as they are good people that meet chapter six of the constitution, then we always allow them to vie with our party. And if they work hard within the ranks of our party and then become communist, then they can take leadership positions in the party. But we are very clear that in terms of propagating our ideas, those people who want to contest for political position must meet chapter six of the constitution. And of course, there are obvious criminals that we cannot allow to come to, you know, to, to the party to take tickets just because we want positions in parliament or um, in, in local assemblies. There are people who are trade unionists that we have worked with. Those people can, you know, can get tickets of the Communist Party of Kenya to contest for political power in their various areas of organizing. We talk about the two-third uh, gender rule, which is uh, an important part of our constitution. And of course, it uh, focuses on special, special interest groups like youth and women and persons with disabilities. And when it comes to this, I want to talk about the issue of unemployment and especially unemployment uh, among the youth. In the strata or in the um, internal structure of the Communist Party of Kenya, we've seen that the youth are, and women have a very uh, special place uh, in this, uh, in the internal structure. What is your take on the unemployment and also the take of the party, the unemployment of the young people and unemployment in general? And what measures do you think we can take to alleviate this issue that is broadening uh, each day? First of all, capitalism thrives on unemployment. There will never be a solution of unemployment within the capitalist system. Even if you look at the most advanced capitalist system, they still have a problem of unemployment. 
Because for big businesses to be able to bargain and buy labor as cheap as possible, they always make sure that there is an army of unemployed. So they are able to negotiate for labor like any other article of trade. So that is the real source of employment. And also if you look at employment only to absorb people for the sake of profit, that means I only employ you if I am going to be profitable. That means I can hire, in fact, in many worse ways in Kenya. Now even we have labor brokers. For example, if you go to Kenya Airways, workers, they have to get somebody to buy their labor and then broker that labor to the Kenya Airways by even cutting off their minimum wage. So in that way, we see that unemployment even if we continue to organize riots in this country or even militant strikes to try and force this government to provide full employment for the, for the youth, it won't be possible. In fact, the inevitable will happen. The government will fall. So to rectify the problem of unemployment, first of all, we have to change the relationship that happens within the people who buy the labor power and the people who own the labor power. And in that way, means that the organization of industrialization must be on cooperative movements and state-owned enterprises. And when we are talking about state-owned enterprises, we are talking about the state that not is not a capitalist state, but a socialist or a, a, progress, a progressive uh, you know, national state to take care of the interest of the workers. The second part is that when you rely on people like IMF and World Bank, the people who have you know, sucked all the, the national resources, they have sucked all the labor power, they have put many countries in problems of debt and unemployment. They have reduced, particularly Kenya, for example, about 19, if you look at 1990s, we used to have industries in Kenya here. We used to have, uh, uh, you know, Brookbone. We have, to, you know, textile industries. We have to have sugar industries. But what did the World Bank do? They came here and implemented what is called the silly structural, uh, you know, subs, the, 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 the structural adjustment plans in our country. And what are the results? The results were quite devastating. In fact, they almost uh, killed our country. For example, Kenya was reduced to a mitumba, or what I call a second class economy, where all clothes come as second class and all the industries in our countries were closed. The second part is the, 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 the most infamous AGOA program that was started by George W. Bush, where Kenya is only used to, you know, for cheap labor in what you call economic processing zones and they negotiate with government to have you know tax holidays low price of water and um, and electricity at the end of it the same clothes that we manufacture with the labor of our own hands they go to the first world countries and come back to us as second as clothes look at our cars in the in the in in, in the nairobi they are all second as second class cars so we are a second class economy because the people who are meant to safeguard our economy are the people that are auctioning us to their, you know, to their uh, international imperialist partners. Mm -hmm. Now we are talking about even the issue, the Kenya got some oil, you know. We, now we have some oil and gas in the Northeastern. But the same Jubilee government has made sure that the only refinery that we had is sold to the oil marketers. And the reason that Total and Shell and all other oil multinationals were buying the refinery, the KPRL at the coast, was not to run it, but was to, to keep it out of business and kill it completely so that they are able to import cheap illegal oil from overseas to come and sell us here as an expensive price. So in the issue of employment, the Communist Party of Kenya is that for us to employ the youth, first of all, we have to socialize the economy. The second thing, we have to take a direct internal path towards industrialization. In the short term, it can be expensive. But don't tell me that we need to sell a sugar factory or we need to you know, wipe out the sugar factory because it is expensive to run and you bring me imported sugar. That imported sugar will only be cheap in the short run. After the entire sugar industry is dealt with and is, is dead, 
then the, the, the sugar from other multinationals will just go up. So in that way, I think we are going to be able to sort out uh, the issues of um, unemployment. unemployment. And general labor or work. When we talk about foreign policy or international solidarity, we've seen this as one of the pillars of communism worldwide and of the Communist Party of Kenya. What is the prospect of the global communist movement? For example, when uh, we see a lot of rhetoric that uh, China has gone capitalist or it has gone west, when you talk about the blockade that is go ongoing in Cuba, or even when you talk about the situation of North Korea, what is your general prospect of the global uh, communist movement? What I could say is that the global communist movement has one other element that you cannot separate from it. That means the communist must be internationalist. In the sense that the Communist Party of Kenya cannot domesticate the struggle only here in Nairobi and Kenya. But we must always pursue international solidarity. In fact, it is one of the elements that must be taken by all the communist parties of the world because we are dealing with a global. Capitalism is global. So that means the antithesis of that global disaster must be international in the sense that what do we need to replace neoliberal globalization that is being sponsored by the United States and Western allies? We need international solidarity based on genuine friendship, based on love, you know, based on mutual respect. And we have seen in many ways Cuba has shown us that path towards international solidarity. So when we talk about the prospects of the co communist movement, as so long as the capitalist crisis move from bad to us, there is always such for an alternative. And there are certain experiments that have already taken place in the world that have since failed. For example, the issues of social democracy in fact, we've even seen certain uh, failures of capitalism has even led to fascism in the United States now and even the then, uh, you know, the, uh, Germany under Hitler. So as so long as capitalism crisis continues to deepen in the globe, there will always be the relevance of communism. communism. And how does that work out? You know, what Karl Marx really did was to say that the laws that govern this universe are knowable. Mm -hmm. And if we go against those laws that are knowable, and that is why he declared socialism as a science, that those laws are knowable. What our role as revolutionaries is to determine those scientific laws that govern the universe and then live up to them. For example, if we did not uh, discover the law of gravity, then anybody who tried to manufacture a plane would have crashed so badly. And that is what happened. So what Karl Marx did was to discover the laws that govern the social productions. And he, com he, he rightly put it that as so long as the people who produce do not have a say on the products that they produce, and as long as the products they produce is appropriated by a few people, then we will see every time there will be a boom and a bust. And we have seen it in 1930s, we have seen it in 1990s, we are even going to see some boom and busts, just like uh, now we are on COVID-19. So as long as we have boom and bust, and we have people dying and others living in opulence, then there can be change, but revolutionaries must always prepare to direct the energies of that change to move the society to a better level. So the prospects of communism, we could say, is even higher today than ever. Our duty is to make sure that we can reach as many working class people to be able to help them see reality. And in that way, they are going to be able to take charge of their destiny to then rejuvenate the communist uh, movement. Because we've seen, for example, during the pandemic, you've seen how the socialist countries have managed the pandemic. It is amazing. Look at Cuba. Cuba had to go and help the most developed countries in Europe to try and avoid uh, you know, several deaths. Look at China, that even though there has been cynical and racist way to attack 
the Chinese people. But we have seen them uh, now, even the Chinese vaccine has not killed anyone. But in Kenya, people are not talking about Chinese vaccine. And we they are talking talk about, about, you know, some America. We'll talk about the, the Chinese vaccine, maybe. Yeah, in, so in... the debate about Chinese vaccine is very important that we always look, we should never only look West when talking about issues to do. Because even we have Chinese citizens here that are being forced to take, you know, vaccines that are from other countries. But even if the government uh, was, you know, falling into the trap of the neoliberal policies of uh, the United States, at least they should allow the Chinese citizens in our country to be able to take their own vaccines. Thank you so much for debunking that issue of, you know, the global prospect of the communist movement and, of course, helping us to see the international uh, relation of, you know, the communist movement around the world and how important that is. And as we are wrapping it up, I would like to ask you about uh, corruption, uh, leadership and integrity, which has been, you know, a very big issue in the country. Corruption is rampant and it's one of the evils that we've had to fight, you know, as a government with Kenya, you know, uh, we keep going up up the scale of of corruption what is your take on that on corruption on leadership and integrity i think this the kenyan people can see that capitalism is an organized crime in fact they thrive on doing each other if you look at each and every capitalist country look at the publications even in the entire millennium they have been writing we are dealing with the dragon of corruption. In Kenya here, if you look at the headlines of 1990s, they are promising how they are dealing with corruption. But as long as big businesses have hijacked political power and they are using the political power to favor business, then corruption at the highest level will only be rampant. And the, the problem with a country like ours, like the neocolonial system, is that the corruption at the highest level is only exposed when they have political disagreements. That is why you can see Mr. Kenyatta every time is telling us that his deputy is corrupt. But we have given him power. Why is he telling us how his deputy is corrupt? Why don't he arrest him and then put him inside because of those corruption charges? So Communist Party of Kenya will continue to agitate, to mobilize and to organize the people of Kenya to fight for corruption within the, uh, against corruption within the neocolonial capitalist system in Kenya. But we will not stop there. We will continue to sensitize the Kenyan masses that capitalism is an organized crime. And any way that capitalism thrives, then the, the mother of corruption is actually capitalism. Until we kill the mother, then more children will always be born. And that, those kids will be even, uh, you know, even remultiply. So corruption in our country will continue to get worse until we change our trajectory of reorganizing the Kenyan state to be the pro people. Thank you very much. And of course, as we wrap up, we've seen a photo on our social media and, you know, uh, on other channels that uh, is a lady who is in a dress, but the back of that dress has, you know, an address that says tax the rich. Maybe give us uh, your comments on that. Of course, uh, the lady managed to, is uh, actually a, a member of the Democratic Party in the United States. He was able to highlight tax the rich. But our duty as revolutionaries is to push that message. And we say, don't just tax the rich. Because if you tax the rich and let them have the political power, have them the dictatorship of the political instrument, then you are taxing from one end and they are serving themselves from the other end. In fact, we have advanced that debate and we are saying we need to seize the means of production and rest it and put it in the solid hands of the working class. And even, in fact, in Kenya here, people have been asking us, Buka, where will you get the money to finance free primary education or to even finance health care? It is firm that we are going to expropriate the rich without compensation. Once we expropriate the rich without compensation, then we'll have the capital required 
to develop our industry and to finance our social services. In fact, the rich political elite will not give up their wealth until they have a real threat of long jail terms or even a real threat to their lives. And that will only be possible when the instruments of the power are with the working class. And now our duty, at least for the first time in the history of Kenya, is to make sure that we deliver justice on behalf of the poor people. Some people tell us that there will be too much blood, but we say even though the Western people will call it red terror, but justice will continue to be done, at least for the first time, not against the masses, but for the masses of the people and by the masses. Thank you so much. And as we end our interview on a much lighter note, there was a photo which uh, will be running on our screens as well. And uh, this photo was uh, taken in the year 1932 in a city in Australia. And it has six men. And these men are wearing their boxes the way uh, women do in beauty contests when um, you know they have a bikini contest to see who is the most beautiful. And these men were actually contesting in a beauty contest of that day to see you know who amongst those uh, who amongst them is the most uh, beautiful and uh, I just want to know what is your take on that and do you think um, this is something we should take when we talk about you know gender equality and feminism first of all from the Marxist lenses we have to know that human beings are a product of nature alongside their environment so from the dialectic laws of nature is that we are always changing. In fact, in a very endless and a cyclic way. So when we talk about gender, or even we talk about the, the, what we call the dogmatic way to look at the human nature, we must always remember the dialectic laws of nature, that everything is changing in an endless and in a cyclic way. In other hostile philosophies like metaphysics, then you look at, uh, you know, they will look at uh, human beings as, um, you know, has a dogmatic and a constant and changing nature. And in that way, they want to be judgmental of, uh, you know, those photos or anything else. But from our philosophical um, uh, thought, we know that uh, we are still under construction. We are progressing as humanity. And even in several years to come, we will be surprised what kind of man and men, uh, what kind of men and women will be in the residents of this earth. Maybe if you and me appear here one million years ago, there will be another species of people with another, you know, probably an eye at the back of their head to be able to safeguard them from other dangers. So you have seen the history of... Um, of the, the giants with one, um, you know, one eye just in front there. Where did they, what happened to them? So we have but to look at the human beings just as any other thing here, because even the stone that is outside there was never stone. At time that stone was magma. So we must realize that the laws of science cannot be beaten just because we think otherwise about them. Thank you so much uh, for gracing us today on the CPK Online Bulletin. It was a pleasure having you. And thank you to our viewers for joining us for this interview. We welcome you to like, share, and comment, and we'll be able to respond to you. And also to buy our issue of the Itikadi. The pay bill number will be running on your screen and the account number as well, where you can send the money and get your copy of Itikadi. I've been your host, Sefusani. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time on our CPK Online Bulletin.